question, what is worship? Many people would say it's that 20 minutes to an hour uh, that precedes the, uh, that comes before the preaching of the word, usually before the offering. It's the time of, of the music or the singing in our church. People will say, and you've heard it, there is good worship. And nobody ever says bad worship, but you know that that's implied. They say, oh, that was good worship. If I asked you this morning, do you think this worship was good worship? I, 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 I uh, imagine every one of you would say, yes, that was good worship. Anointed. Anointed. No one ever says, oh, that was bad worship or it was mediocre. There's good worship. There's, uh, there's better worship. You know, that church has better worship than the other church. There's good worship and then there's better worship and there's awesome worship. We talk about in, uh, in worship in those in those terms, but the question is, uh, it, it's usually just a judgment call, or we, we determine uh, what, we dis, what we discern to be good for us. It's an assessment of the quality. Generally, we're talking about the quality of the instruments and the quality of the voices, and we, we talk about good worship or better wor worship. My question this morning is, what is the criteria we use in judging worship? Most often, friends, it's it's our enjoyment. Say, well, I really enjoyed that worship service. That I really loved those songs. I, I really loved that music. And therefore, that was good worship. If we don't like the songs, or we not too fond of the quality of the voices or the instruments, we might not be so apt to say we, we thought it was good. Uh, worship often in the modern church is used as a marketing tool. Come to our church. We have, we have good worship. Or there's a church you can go to if you really like worship. You can go to that church because they have awesome worship or better worship. And we, we give these terms. And oftentimes we'll find the elevated stage. Yeah, I know, you're going to hear it. And the colored lights and the smoke machines and the screaming lead guitar and all the paraphernalia that is associated with modern worship. Oftentimes people will go to churches where there is good worship or better worship or awesome worship so that they might receive something. I want to go and I want to receive and I want to enjoy myself. That church is, that church is great because they, they jump up and down and, and they really have fun in worship. So we go to receive. I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm in need, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged. So I'll go and I'll, and I'll go to worship and I'll feel better. Well, friends, there's nothing wrong with receiving from the Lord. In fact, Peter said, to whom else can we turn, Lord, for you have the words of eternal life. There's nothing wrong with receiving from the Lord. There's nothing wrong with coming into his presence and receiving from him. In fact, I encourage you, if you have a need, if you're depressed or discouraged or have a need of healing or you're lost or, or you need anything, I encourage you to run to the presence of God. I encourage you run and, and run quickly and stay long and receive all that he has. But the problem, friends, is if that's the focus of our worship, if that's the reason we come to worship God so that we might receive, then we have completely missed the essence of biblical worship. We have, we will, I, I say we will have failed to worship God if our sole purpose of coming is that we might receive and that we might enjoy and that we might have. Are you with me? Amen. Worship, friends, is not a segment of our church service, but an attitude of the heart and a way of life. I know there's a lot of things I could say about worship. If we were to discuss it today, it would take days and days and weeks to discuss all, every aspect because this Bible from cover to cover is filled. The, one of the main themes of this Bible is worship. So I only have a couple of minutes. This is not a, I'm not going to enter into a whole lot, but there are a couple of things that I want to share with you this morning. First of all, all true worship begins with humility. All true worship begins with humility. Look at the first offering recorded in the Bible. Anybody want to tell me what the first offering recorded in the Bible was? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel brought offerings before the Lord. Now... <clears throat> Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Th think about this. Uh, God said, by the sweat of your brow, you'll bring forth fruit. And so Cain. 
he, he sweat and he tilled the land and he planted the seed and he harvested his crop and he brought unto the Lord of the, of the sweat of his brow. Friends, there's nothing wrong. Let me, let me just tell you, there was nothing wrong with his offering. He brought of the sweat of his brow. He brought of the work of his hands and he gave it unto the Lord. That's a good thing to do. How many know? Serve God with your labor. Serve God with, with, with everything you have, with your substance. There's nothing, whoa, hello. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground, the fruit of his labor. Abel brought of the firstlings of the flock. He brought an animal. Uh, Cain was a, a tiller of the field, a, a farmer, so he brought of his substance. Abel was a farmer, and so he brought of his. Are you with me so far? Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's was rejected. Now listen, I understand the typology regarding the blood offering and the bloodless offering represented here. I understand the typology and there's a lot I could say about that. I'm, I don't believe that this was necessarily an atonement. It was an offering. Let's look at it from its context. Are, are you with me? Yeah. Let's look at it from its context. What this was was an offering of worship. Cain brought his. Abel brought his. They both brought their offering of worship unto the Lord. Now, I understand, as I said, the blood and the bloodless offering, but I want to look at something um, that might go perhaps in some respects a little deeper. Just listen. It wasn't so much a matter of what they did, but why. And worship is not so much a matter of what we do, but why. I said that all true worship begins with humility. It must begin with humility. In verse 4 of Genesis, uh, it says, And the Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Listen. God accepted Abel's, Abel and his offering. Did you, did you catch that? God accepted Abel and therefore accepted his offering. God rejected Cain and therefore Cain's offering. It was the, it, it, it was the person. Listen. Cain gets upset. God, he, he brought his best, he brought it before the Lord, and God rejected Cain and his offering. And Cain gets all upset. He, he, he gets wroth. And God says to him, Cain, why are you wroth? Why are you upset because I did not accept your offering? Because I did not accept you. Don't you know that if you do good, you will be, you will be accepted? You listening? You will be, and thou will be accepted. Listen to me. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? You with me? God didn't simply reject Cain's offering. He rejected Cain and therefore his offering. It wasn't a matter of what he brought, but why. I don't believe there was anything that Cain could have brought that would have been acceptable to God. Because his attitude was not right. His heart was not right. When he brought the offering and God rejected it, he got all upset. Why? Because he expected something in return. He expected the pleasure of God. He expected the blessings of God. He expected the acceptance of God. He came with ulterior motives. He came expecting that God would be pleased with him. Do you understand what I'm saying? He didn't simply come and surrender all that he had to the Lord. He came expecting. And when God did not bless him as he saw fit, as he believed he should be blessed, he got upset. See, God rejected, I believe, Cain because of the attitude of his heart. He didn't come with the right attitude. He didn't come saying, Lord, I love you and I give you everything. He came expecting something in return. Hear me. Hear me. The Lord is under no obligation to receive our worship. If Cain brought a thousand lambs, before the Lord, and his heart was not right. God is under no obligation to accept the thousand lambs. And if we come into the presence of God in worship and our heart is not right, he is under no obligation to accept our praise or to accept our worship if the attitude of the heart is not right. Listen, King David acknowledged the mercies of God in Psalm uh, chapter 5, verse 7. He says, but as for me... I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. David said, in, in the multitude 
of your mercies. Not only in the mercy, but in the multitudes of your mercies. I will stand in the house of God. I will worship you in the multitude of your mercies. Listen, we don't need to grovel at, at, at God's feet when we come into, into, the, into the church. We, we don't necessarily need to do that. But we must acknowledge that there is no way that we ourselves are worthy to enter into the presence of a holy God. There's no way we could just come on our own and stand before God and be acceptable unto Him. We must acknowledge that there is no way. And it is in the midst of the multitude of His mercies that we stand to worship Him. Psalm 95, verse 6, again, David the psalmist says this, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. It's a humble reverence when we enter into His presence. A humility of heart and reverence and fear. We bow our knee or we bow our heart, but the attitude must be one of humility. I am so concerned, as you know, I am I am most concerned about the attitude uh, or the lack of reverence in the worship of the modern church. I'm so concerned, friends, about the lack of reverence that too often is associated with contemporary worship. It's often little more or, or little less than a rock concert performed for the pleasure of the attendees. Friends, we must enter into his presence, first of all, with humility with humility, with brokenness of heart, and with reverence and with fear. All true worship begins with humility. And secondly, who is the recipient of worship? Who receives in worship? We, we hear it so often. Oh, it's awesome down there. It's, it's glorious in that church. The worship is so good. We're so blessed. It, we get so much out of it. Oh, you got to go there and, and receive. It's just wonderful. Friends, you're not necessarily the recipient. You're certainly not the primary recipient of worship. God is. Amen. He is the recipient. It's all about Him. It's, it's not about us or what we get. What a wonderful worship we, service we had. What, what exactly do you mean? We had a wonderful worship service. That was what exactly do you mean by a wonderful worship service? Well, we felt the presence of the Lord. We were blessed. True. The Bible says in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. You can't go into the presence of God and not be blessed. You can't be in his presence without experiencing the joy of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. Listen to me, friends. You can't, you can't enter His presence without it. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Indeed, you will receive of God in His presence. But worship shouldn't be about you or how you feel or what you get. You still with me? I think there's three of you that agree. <laughs> Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2. David said, give. Listen to me. Give unto the Lord. O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Three times in these two verses, David says, Give unto the Lord, give unto the Lord, give unto the Lord. Enter into his gates, Psalm 100 and verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. I'm not giving you a formula this morning, but the very first thing we should do when we enter into the presence of God is to show our gratitude. Amen. Don't you, don't you, I won't say hate, hate's a strong word, don't you dislike ungrateful people? <laughs> people that always, they're, they're always on the take. They're always, there's never enough that you could do for them, and you never hear thank you. And if you do, it's a weak thank you. Don't you dislike ungrateful people? We, suppose, we should go into the presence of the Lord being grateful. You hear often our, our prayers begin, Almighty God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, thank you for what we have received. Friends, be thankful for what you have. First of all, if you're, if you're a child of God, you should be so very thankful that you're not going to hell. Period. If there's nothing else God does for me, dear God, thank you. Thank you, thank you. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving, being thankful for his providence, for his care, for his mercy, his grace, for everything that he has given us and all that he's promised us. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you. 
Then we enter into praise. We praise him for all the wonderful works. Look at the beauty that he has created. Look at all the splendor of his name and the works of his hands. We praise him. And then we worship him and we adore him for the almighty, glorious God that he is. Not, not necessarily for what he gives us, but just for him. The majesty of his name. We sang about it. The glory of his being. He is worthy, friends, to be worshipped and to be glorified. Now hear me. You still with me? Amen. This is not optional. It's not optional. Nor is it a requirement. Hear me. If, it's, if you just, well, I feel like worshiping God today, maybe tomorrow I won't, it's not optional. And at the same time, it's not a requirement. It's not out of duty. Cain may have come out of duty, and he brought an offering because he had to. You, you follow me? I'll come and I'll go to church and I'll stand with everybody and I'll sing, but I, but I don't want to. I don't feel like it. Friends, it's, uh, you don't do it out of duty. It's not a requirement. It must flow freely out of the heart of a child of God. Even if you don't feel like it, because he's worthy. It's got to flow from your innermost being. You, it's got to come from you. Listen, A.W. Tozer on many occasions said, if worship bores you, you're not ready for heaven. There was nobody bored this morning. If you were bored, I got to slap you to wake you up. <laughs> or, or get the paddles, because you're dead. But even if it wasn't good worship, which in some, on another day or in another church or someplace else, even if you were in a place where you thought it wasn't good worship, friends, that it's not, again, it's not a matter of how you feel. This is what we're called to do. This is what we're saved to do, to worship God. And if you're bored with worship, you're not ready for heaven. Because what do you think we're going to do for all eternity? We're not going to be little Lord Funtleroids floating on clouds, <laughs> playing harps, flapping our little wings. But we're going to be spending eternity before the throne of God. We're going to be living before Him, existing before Him, and glorifying Him for all eternity. Now, if, you, if that sounds boring to you, don't worry about it. Hear me? If, if you're bored with that, don't worry about it. It won't apply to you. If you're not, if, bo if worship bores you, you're not ready. You're not ready for heaven. We were created to worship God. Jesus said that the Father seeks the worship of those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Old Testament worship often accompanied, was accompanied by the offering of an animal. A sacrifice was given, a substitute was given. The New Testament church offers to God the sacrifice of praise. Listen, Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Romans 12, 1, the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God... That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service of worship. It's only reasonable that in the, as we stand in the multitude of the mercies of God, that we would present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him. I'm closing, but don't get excited. It's a long close. <laughs> we were created to worship God. And when mankind fell in sin... We were separated from the presence of God. Uh, Adam, Adam and Eve kicked out, banished from the garden, separated from his presence. They used to walk with God in the cool of the eve, and now sin separated, banished them. No longer were they allowed to be in his presence. But Christ came, friends, to restore us to that relationship, to restore us to that place where we could enter again into his presence and we could offer our praise and our worship. We could have relationship with him.